little throwback Sunday. I love it. Thank you, Lord, for having a church filled with praise and worship, loving to worship the Lord. Worship is a good thing. We're going to talk a little bit about that today and, and uh, look into our, our, uh, our study, Luke chapter number one. We're still there. Go to Luke one and join me there. We've covered a few verses so far. We had an introduction and a couple messages so far in Luke. And here we are now walking into Luke chapter number one around verse number, not around, specifically in, verse number 39 down through 55. Uh, there's so much here. There's 80 verses in the first chapter of Luke. And of course, Luke's gospel brings with it so many, so many different specific pieces and parts of the accounting uh, and what the Lord would have for the accounting in Scripture of, of course, the, the pregnancy, the, um, the incredible Holy Spirit um, in dwelling into Mary that brings us the baby who becomes the man who becomes the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. We have the accounting in detail of... Um, the angel Gabriel visiting both Elizabeth and Mary, and we've looked already at the last week's message on what an announcement, what a birth announcement that was made. And today we're going to look uh, at the time that Elizabeth and Mary have a visit together. Such a powerful moment, such an incredible, uh, just a really neat little setting. I don't know, I, I mentioned this once in a while, I don't know if you do this often when you're reading Scripture. You just kind of stop and say, God, I really would like you to put me in that historical place of the setting. What's the place and the time, the people that are in it? And you need to do that a little bit. Consider that there has been silence from God to the people Israel, to the Jews for 400 years, give or take, and now they're going to hear from God profoundly. And of course, it all gets kicking here with the messenger Gabriel, God's man coming in and bringing the word to Elizabeth first and then, of course, to Mary. And now, of course, in verse number 39 down through 55, we see them interacting. And what we're going to find, again, as the theme of our study is, is that this is a place where Mary and Elizabeth, to one another, make hope known. They talk about the hope that they have that, of course, Elizabeth has John in her tummy, but yet she magnifies and exalts the Lord in their time together. That, of course, Mary in their time together, as she journeys, as the Scripture doesn't say specifically, but historically gives us an accounting of where she is to making herself get to a place in the city, a little town, a little village of Judah, where Elizabeth is, she walks nearly a hundred miles in this accounting. And you consider, again, she's pregnant, just a short time. Elizabeth is pregnant for approximately as well, it says six months that she's pregnant. So this older cousin that Elizabeth is to Mary is visited by her. And of course, it, it's much better that she comes to visit, the younger visiting the older. There's also that in play here today when you think of the setting that hey, these two people here have quite a bit of difference in age. It is said that Elizabeth is barren. She's been with Zechariah, the priest, for a number of years. Of course, we know in Mary's situation, which is a toughie, of course, she has heard from Gabriel that she is going to have this baby. His name is Jesus, as it says in verse 31. And you're going to bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And as we talked of last year, the fulfillment of prophecy in Scripture, that's who Mary is, being the vessel in the holy of holies house for the one that is in her. Consider again when we have this setting now of Mary going to visit Elizabeth that they truly have this visit turn into a place of worship. That's what we're going to talk about today. I just throw this out at you before we get into a couple thoughts. 
When's the last time you had a visit like that with someone? You were intended to go sit down and visit with a sister in the Lord. Uh, you intended guys to sit down with a brother in the Lord, and you're going to have a visit over some matters. Maybe it's something of your family. Maybe it's some type of counsel. Maybe it's something where, hey, um, ministry-wise, we need to meet over things. And you're having this visit, and then it turns into a time of worshiping the Lord of thinking about all that he has done, how faithful that he has been, how that he is all that you need. You see, we ought to have more visits like that. That's the setting today. That's the kind of visit that's going on today is Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And it starts out as just, hey, I want to come see you. I want to go visit you in a covered place maybe where since you're married to a priest, it might be pretty safe to visit you, cousin. And when I come to see you and visit you, I know that with all the things that I could be worrying about, I'm not going to spend time in worry. I'm going to spend time in worship. Maybe today you consider this as we look in to this visit, that it is a time for you to say, you know what, I need some more visits like this kind of visit. I need a visit where it's not all about administrative, organizational, get some things done, counseling, and all that, which is important, yes, but in this setting, that they have all these things they need to work through in their two pregnancies, and yet it turns into not a place of worry, but a place of worship. You see, the stories of John's birth and Jesus' birth do parallel each other, of course, with one clear difference— Jesus is superior, and of course, he is deity. But keep in mind this. His existence did not begin when he was humanity in the tummy of Mary. He has always been, and he always will be. He didn't need to be created since he is God Almighty. But he is humanity in that he becomes humanity, but he's also deity, so please don't ever let the false doctrine and theology that says, well, Jesus had to be made and had to be created. He always is, and he always was, and he is the I am, the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. But in his humanity, son of man, he has to come in and be birthed by a mother. One does not take away from the other. Most importantly, we can never take away from the importance of the deity of the Son of God as much as we know he is the Son of Man. Consider that they have similarities in that there's an introduction uh, to the parenting, that there is a, hey, neither one of them have ever had a baby. Of course, one is barren and older. One is young and betrothed and espoused to a man. They're, by the way, of course, we know they're not married yet. But there is parallels. There's a giving of a sign. There is the response of the, each one of the mothers. There's a pregnancy that they have. And again, up to this point, they're childish. So there's lots of similarities. But remember, Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. John is great. John is good. But Jesus is greater. There's so much here in this setting of how they rejoice in one another, but most of all, they rejoice in the Lord. You see, Luke's account of these two women becoming pregnant screams out one incredible thing. Miracle! This is a miracle. Well, okay, that's nice. This is a miracle. A miracle for the woman who is going to be carrying the Son of Man. A miracle to a woman who has been barren like Hannah and called out and desired as Zechariah did for a child. And as the angel meets them both, says, you're no longer going to be barren. In fact, you're going to give birth to a guy named John. And as it says in verse number 15 in chapter 1 of Luke, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He, will, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, which we will talk a little about here in a minute when we read the passage of Scripture. It screams of God's incredible miracle to give them both 
of pregnancy. In fact, the scripture, as we have said from last week's message, and the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Just a reminder from scripture, that's clearly the miracle. And just to add a little something in Luke's accounting, we see in verse number 36, and behold thy cousin. I want to let you know, Mary, Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. You see, Elizabeth's not aware, but Mary is made aware. Consider that Elizabeth gets a visit from Mary, and then, wow, a little bit more of the miracle unfolds in their spirit-filled, worship-filled visit. You see, two happy mothers had a visit. It was filled with rejoicing over the precious favor that God put upon them both, especially Mary. Think about this. They both have little babies. One is really, really, really tiny in Mary, and one's a little bit bigger in Elizabeth. Life has been birthed inside of them. If you need any confirmation that life starts at conception, look in the Bible. It's clear. It's not even, not even something to wrestle. Well, I don't know what he means. We're going to read the scripture here in a moment. There's a conversation over God's incredible grace. There's a conversation over Mary carrying the Son of God and the Son of Man. Our theme verse, of course, is out of Luke chapter number 19. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Mary knows that. And as the accounting, you read the Christmas story, we refer to it when we have some interaction in Scripture over Mary and her son and all that. But we're really going to look at this thing and spend some Really focus time on what Elizabeth says and what Mary says because this visit is very powerful and very special. During this visit of two women pregnant by a miracle, both Elizabeth and Mary recognized who deserved the worship. It wasn't Elizabeth, though she's encouraging Mary lifting Mary above who she is. It's not Mary saying, oh, Elizabeth, you're going to give birth to the greatest prophet of all time. No, no, no. Their visit is all about the one that they have come to worship together. And that's what we're thinking about today as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Church 2,000 years later after this, what kind of visit have you had like this that again started out as something that was just nominal nominal you just hey i'm just going to get together and we're just going to talk and it turns into a time of worshiping the lord it wasn't scheduled it wasn't prepared that that's the way it would be you see very simply then it's not hard to figure out that the title of our message is when a visit became worship this visit became worship we find out that they both believed, but Mary, even more so, it's magnified as she magnifies the Lord of her faith. It shows that they're both blessed, but that Mary is blessed with all this joy that you see and experience in this interaction. And then their worship comes back to a place of hope. See, in the midst of the most difficult time that Mary seemingly could be in, as I said earlier, she finds a place of worship. She finds a place where, with Elizabeth, God's in the center of everything. Pick up with me. I want to look at Elizabeth first. So I want to read the first few verses of Elizabeth speaking and their interaction from that side. And then we'll take it up and look at Mary's interaction with Elizabeth, and most of all in our accounting, her song unto the Lord. Join me, verse number 39. Here we have the accounting of Mary beginning her journey, arising, and then making her way to Elizabeth's house. Verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah. Interesting that it's mentioned with haste. She can't wait to get there. Verse number 40, and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. 
And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember what I read in verse number 15 earlier about this one man named John who's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It says there, hmm, even from his mother's womb. We'll get into that in a minute here. Consider the setting. Consider what's happening here. It says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 42, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What a neat statement that she makes in that question. She is recognizing who she's in the presence of, the mother of my Lord. Most of all, that she's in the presence of my Lord. Whew. Verse number 44. For lo, as soon, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, Father, just in this short time in your word, I just want to pray one more time. Just want to stop and grab just a second, just a moment of stillness in each one of our hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus for everyone that is hearing your words being read and spoken. And we say thank you, Lord, for Scripture, for your word, for how you've preserved it. And it's right before us just as the way that you have us to read it and learn. So I pray by your Holy Spirit that you will reprove and teach us and direct us in the way that we can learn from you. We want to be better and healthier in our relationship with you, Holy God. So I pray that you will bring to light what it means to have a visit with someone, our brother and sister in the Lord, that can turn into a place of worshiping you. You truly deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In thinking about what Luke has written down here in his gospel, and as these two are visiting and rejoicing in all the goodness of God, and that's, there, again, it makes, makes this gospel, of course, it's unique in its writing, and it's God, of course, and his, his way of doing things by the Spirit of God through Luke and and then the practical side of it of Luke and having some insight here. And you think he's writing down Mary making a visit, Mary journeying by, with uh, haste, Mary sitting in the house of Zechariah, who, by the way, is dumb and can't speak, who probably is off by himself so they can have a visit, and he's not going to interfere in that visit. By the way, quick tip, guys from Zechariah, if a couple of sisters are visiting in the Lord, well, get out of the room, will you? Leave them alone. Don't interject your smartness or reveal that there's not much smartness to reveal. But these two right here, just thinking, now I know I'm reading into it, but Zechariah is there and he can't speak, so what's he going to add? I wonder if he hears in the other room the words of salutation and exaltation and magnification of the Lord. But Mary, again, is in this place. It's pretty obvious. And she's in a priest's home, Zechariah, and she's with her cousin, and she's, she's spending some time visiting. And Elizabeth knows that Mary is who she is. She's the fulfillment of Scripture. She is God's vessel, and she is going to encourage her in the faith that as she's six months pregnant with John, she's encouraging this woman, and she most of all is magnifying the Lord. So, two simple things about Elizabeth. Here you go. First one. Elizabeth realized the visit became worship when the essence of their joy together was due to the presence of the Lord. How do you know that the Lord was present? 
Let me check. And it came to pass, in verse 41, that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. They were in the presence of God, where two or more are gathered together. These two are godly women. These two have been visited by the messenger Gabriel. These two are attentive to the word of God. They're attentive to the presence of God. And here they are. So let me ask you, personally today, what kind of visit do you have with your brothers and sisters in the Lord? It says that the babe leaped in her womb in the presence of the Lord. That's incredible to think. That, hey, an older woman lifting up this younger person, this younger woman, in the Lord, everything is in the Lord. And this baby, again is, proof that there's life that is in the womb and that the presence of God is real. Remember what it says in Jeremiah 1.5? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. These two getting together with babies in their tummy, both of them, they're complete miracles in different settings of life. Realize that this visit became worship when the essence of their joy together was due to the presence of the Lord. Is that the way you see it in your visits? It says again in verse number 40. Three, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Again, a reinforcement that they're in the presence of the Lord together. That that is the essence of their joy. The essence of their rejoicing. What's the essence of your rejoicing when you're with someone? Or is not very rejoicing? Maybe we need to put the Lord in the center of our get-togethers. In the center of our one-on-one -on -one visits. Maybe husbands and wives should have visits over matters that bring the presence of the Lord in the middle of them. Maybe that would do a little bit better for each one of us to seek out this type of visit so that it could be worship in the visit. Consider this, 1 John chapter number 1. Many of you know this verse about fellowship. Let me just read it for you real quick. 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 3. Now let's not leave out verse number 4. Because in the context of the letter that John is writing here, there's a whole lot about fellowship and there's a whole lot about joy. And he says in verse number four, In these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This joy over the manifestation of holy, holy God. The manifestation that you can be in his presence as a born-again believer at any moment, at any time, because Jesus Christ took down that wall of partition. Jesus Christ took down that veil that was between you and me. And they're in the midst of two people. They're in the midst of one another. And they, who haven't had the Holy Spirit come yet at the day of Pentecost, but it says that the Holy Ghost is in Elizabeth to the point where her baby leapt because of the presence of the Lord. Because he, John, has the presence. He has the filling. He is in Elizabeth's womb. As much as she declares, how would the mother of the Lord, the Lord, in her, come to me? And yet, we are amazed, and we ought to be in this setting, when yet, as a born again believer, every single one of us have the Lord What have we done to mess up this beautiful communion 
that he has made possible in worship for us every single moment of every single day for every single visit that we could have for somebody or with somebody. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper here. We're going to do it together. It's like having a visit together. And we're going to partake. This is possible for us in Jesus Christ all the time. Here's another thing about Elizabeth that I see here in this setting. Elizabeth ensured the visit. Not just realized the visit, but ensured the visit became worship when the words proclaimed from her mouth exalted the faithfulness of the Lord. That's how this thing rolled out here. She ensured the visit became worship. It's not that she just talked about it, that, hey, it's going to be, or that, hey, we're going to make it worship because I know I'm in the presence of the Lord. She then spoke words that proclaimed the faithfulness of the Lord. Verse 44. For lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy, verse 45, and blessed is she that believed. And there shall be a performance of these th those things which were told her from the Lord. The faithfulness of the Lord is who and what she's exalting by the words that she's speaking. Is that what I do in my visits? I was visiting with someone recently, just talking over stuff and life and health, and it just, the conversation just turned into this. I said, thank you, God. There has to be, though, some intentionality. The words that I proclaim and the words you proclaim out of our mouths must exalt the faithfulness, not of just yourself, which is fine, but the faithfulness of the Lord in your life. The Lord has been faithful to Elizabeth. The Lord has been faithful to Mary. And that's at the core root of their opportunity here to have worship between each other. Oh, my. And don't forget, here when we look at Mary here in about a few minutes, she does the same exact thing. God's faithfulness is evident over centuries that these two women have been following the Lord God. In the scriptures, in the old covenant, they know by record and by accounting in the gospel that these two women were not coincidentally, by chance, chosen to be the vessels that would carry the prophet who is going to proclaim the Savior and the Lord to come in just a few years. You see, the Gospel of Luke, in so many ways and forms and fashion, with each one of the Gospels having their particular identity in some way, but the harmonic type of way that they interact and, and, and everything, though, he shows some things. He shows things like this right here in their interaction. You go, how in the world did he capture the essence of a beautiful visit that you and I would just go, ah, somebody came over to the house the other day. We had pizza and wings. You wouldn't believe how much pizza he ate when I had him over to my house. And that's what you talk about. Oh, you don't believe how, how awful the royals are. Have you figured out they're not very good? You may even have a good visit over, hey, Mighty Mites was awesome yesterday. Some people were happy when the cloud cover came over. Some people were sad. Oh, you know the weather. You know how the weather is. Did you know that the grass is disappearing on the sports park again? Does it ever move from that kind of visit, which is fine, to a place of, hey, we had break time yesterday. And we use this word comprehension, which simply to the kids would be understanding. And the theme of the break time for the second season of Mighty Mites is, hey, an ADP sports charity Excuse me, an ADP sports championship player has to have certain traits. And one of them has to, has to have the ability to understand. And at the essence of it was Jesus Christ speaking in Luke chapter number 9 and talking about how he's going to suffer, how he's going to go through this awful thing and be put into the hands of sinful men and the disciples don't have a clue what he's talking about. They didn't understand. And in that setting, we don't have any accounting in Luke's gospel of them asking questions of Jesus Christ which they later do. 
What's the point? Is it just a nice visit? Is it just a good discussion over things? Or does it get to the essence of why we're together, which is to worship the holy God of the universe and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we here just to have a neat time? Or are we going to spend some time in the Lord's Supper as an extra special time together? Yes. Are we going to sing some songs? Yes, I hope. I hope Pastor Dwayne picks some good ones today, I tell you. Or are we at the place where we realize what an opportunity to have a visit together. Let's see what really can become our visit. A time of worship. Let's pick up Mary here and let's read about Mary and make a couple comments about her and finish up our message here. Here we go. Here's halftime. Now we're going into the second half. Here we go. Pick up with me in verse number 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Boy, she gets right into it. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Think of how she's magnifying the Lord. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Here's some Old Testament scripture. She interacts here in her exaltation and magnificent statements of Jesus, of the Lord God Almighty. Verse 51, he has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath holpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house just as she's about to give birth. You see joy here. You see rejoicing here. You see hope declared. When Luke gets this gospel accounting from the Holy Spirit to write it down, you see all this stuff right here. You see that in the gospel of Luke and how its text is laid out, that there's joy here. That there's rejoicing here. That she is magnifying Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior. You see it there? My soul does magnify the Lord. God rejoiced in God my Savior. She magnifies Jesus as Lord, as Savior. She magnifies his power, his holiness, his mercy. She magnifies all of his works, past and future. Consider that right now here, as we break down a couple things about Mary, that this song of praise, in this occasion, in this setting, really comes to a place of worship and worship alone. This is needed more for all of us together. You got a coffee house sitting up there, out there. If you don't have a place to gather outside of this building, you can use it anytime. Just call. If it's not open, we'll let you sit in there and have a visit with somebody. You can visit with someone at her house. You can, well, I need to have it be a one one-on-one -on -one discipleship thing. Well, that's excellent. That's awesome. But what if you just had a visit like these two ladies? To talk about the miracle of God. To talk about how glorious it is and not talk about all the other junk. There's not a bit of junk that's going on here. Now, I understand you've got to cover junk. But after a while, it's got to move to a place where the visit turns into worship. Hopefully more sooner than later. So three simple things about Mary, and we'll tie it together. They're really just straightforward here. You see each one of them rather clearly. The first one, as you capture what's going on here, it says up on the screen this. Mary confirmed the visit became worship. When? When did it become worship? When she magnified the Lord with inspiration. Inspiration of who the Lord truly was to her. Who's the Lord to you? 
Who is the Lord to you? Is there some type of Holy Spirit, some type of Word of God inspiration? Is God inspired His Word that you can grab and say, this is the Lord to me. He is my Lord. Salvation is mine. He is my compassion. He is my power. He is holy to me. He, look at verse 49. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things. So it says that he's mighty, that he's done great things, and it says holy is his name. Is that the kind of conversation that we ought to have? Yes. Is that the kind of visit that we need to have more of? Yes. You see, Mary's joy is overflowing. She has a fullness of the Spirit of God within her that you can see in how she's talking. She has a fullness of the Word of God in how she's speaking. And she magnifies the Lord with inspiration of who he is to me. Do you ever do that? Write down who he is to you. Do you ever tell other people who he is to you? What he has done for you? You could be a source of inspiration scripturally word of God wise to someone when you say, you know, God is my rock. He is my salvation. In whom should I fear? He is the one that I hold on to. He is the one I can trust. He is the one that I can have faith in. Maybe it is like the animals, Terry, and that they're the ones that trust the Lord more than any of us because as creatures, it's just interesting that you said that earlier, and what I'm saying here from the message is Mary stopped everything in their visit and said, just as Elizabeth has encouraged me and exalted the Lord and talked about, just, hey, I love that you're faithful, <coughs> and great is the Lord's faithfulness, I need to now say something. And that's what Mary's doing. She confirmed the visit became worship when she magnified the Lord with inspiration of who the Lord truly was to her. So again, who is the Lord to you? When's the last time you expressed joy and praise of the Lord? And God was the centerpiece of your subject matter in my subject matter. Another thing about Mary that I see here, Mary proved the visit became worship when she glorified the Lord with Scripture that declared what He has done for us. This would take three hours to dig up the Scripture. She uses the Psalms. She references 1 Samuel. She talks about Hannah. We see this woman proving that the visit became worship when she glorified the Lord with Scripture. She declared what He has done for us. Can you see it here? Verse number 50. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. She knows in Scripture that it's said from Psalms that he had mercy on the nation of Israel. That the psalmist wrote such things. Verse 51, he has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He is taking care of business for the nation of Israel time after time after time. And she is reciting old Testament scripture. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. And of course, in verse number 53, he hath filled the hungry with good tidings, excuse me, with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. You know, God has a way of taking care of the helpless. It's in the scripture. He always comes by there and stops it and says, let me give you some mercy. I'm going to take care of you because I know you're helpless. What we do then do with that, well, we ought to glorify the Lord with the scripture that he fulfilled and how he did that and said, hey, God, I can see you're at work here. I'm going to declare what you have done today just like you did it generation after generation after generation. He's there for the humble, but the, but the prideful, what does it say he does? It says there, huh, he hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree, those people that are humble. He exalts them. We know the scriptures in the New Testament. Peter mentions it. James mentions it. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up, which comes from the Old Testament. What about what, what Hannah said? 
to magnify the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter number 2, after she gives her son and dedicates him to the service of the Lord, after she begged and was barren to have a child. You see, Mary, in her second part of the song, shows us that she knows Old Testament Scripture and speaks of the countless times that God showed mercy and was there for the people. Even verse 53, he has filled the hungry. I guess he took care of the hungry too. I heard there was a nation of Israel that wasn't very thankful for that. Kind of reminds me of myself. When Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, referencing what he just spoke about. Why are you so worried about what you're going to wear? Your clothes. I take care of the lilies. I take care of the flowers. I take care of the birds. And you're concerned about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to wear. God has come through every time for us, his people, as he truly spoke in old times that Mary uses scripture to definitely, completely give God glory for what he has already done. And then lastly, I see Mary showed the visit, became worship when she repeated what the Lord promised he would do for his servant Israel. You see it in verse 54. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. He says, I help them. I've been speaking I have been fulfilling. I've never gone back on any of my promises. I promise and I promise and I promised. And I came through and I came through. If you go to Psalm 98, you can see his mercy come flying through, come out, and you can see him keeping his promises. You can see in Genesis 12 how he put a promise before Abraham and came through with every single thing. But keep in mind, with all that Israel is, it might be safe to say that without him, those na the nation of Israel, without their rejection, he wouldn't have come if they had received, but they continually pushed away all of God's providence and all of God's promises, and they rejected and rejected. And here's Mary saying, hey, let me repeat what the Lord promised he would do for his servant Israel. He sent the Messiah, and they rejected him. He's going to send him again. Oh my, it'll be different then. He sent them the Savior of the world. He sent them the Messiah to redeem them, and he re they rejected him. And there's Mary proclaiming the truth of God's promise that he has never gone back on his word. No matter how many times you have promised and not kept, made a covenant and not kept, vowed a vow and, for, uh, and did not, and you deferred to pay it. God says, I've made promises, I've made covenants, and I never went back on any of them. And that's God to the nation of Israel. And that's God to tell us as the bride of Christ in the church in a different set of promises. We haven't replaced. He just is dealing with us in a beautiful way because of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the promises that you and I have. Oh my, in the Lord. Here's Mary saying, I'm going to show you that the visit really became worship. The visit truly confirmed worship in every form and fashion. Mary proclaimed and proved that the visit was all about worshiping the Lord. This is how we end today in coming into the Lord's Supper. Very simply this. I put quotes around it. Our visit, I mentioned it in passing maybe one time. Our visit together, it's our visit. But we're just not visiting because I'm up here and you're down there. And, but maybe you're visiting with someone there. Maybe your visit today was someone, maybe it's your spouse, I don't know. But your visit with the Lord ought to be a little bit more of a deeper 
worship. And now that we partake in the Lord's Supper, would it not be, would it not behoove, would it not push us to say, you know what, together we can make this time a time of worship. You say, it's always like that, Pastor. I'm not so sure it's always that way for everybody, but it ought to be. You see, our visit together ought to turn into worship, just like Elizabeth and Mary. And today, as we visit in the name of Jesus Christ, we gather to worship him on the first day of the week, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to partake in the Lord's Supper. That you and I would say, you know what? This has to become even deeper in worship. I need to remember what he's done for me. And I need to remember what he is to me and all that he means to me. And then I need to examine myself to see what things I need to get aside, get out of the way, so that my visit with him is worship before I have visits with others in worship. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer as we go into the Lord's Supper. Go ahead, Debbie, and you can go ahead and start. I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to get up and come and get the elements, and then you can spend some time in prayer as well. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word this morning and how already we've had worship in your word. We've had worship in prayer, and we've had worship in praise and song. And again, as I said earlier, I'm so thankful for that. I thank you for the, the men that I get a chance to have visits with that turn into worship. I thank you for the visits that I've had with my wife that have turned into worship. Not always have they, Father. Then you know I, I've made that a place of repentance for you. I need to be better in that area for my children, my grandchildren. Why can't our visits, Father, be better in worship? So that's something, God, that we need to do better. So now we come into the Lord's Supper and we're visiting together most of all, we're visiting with you. We're sitting down with you and telling you how faithful you have been. We are telling you that we remember, Jesus, all that you have done for us and all that you are to us. And we're going to examine ourselves. So God, in this time of examination, this time of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you will be blessed, that you will be honored and glorified. And that as we go through this ordinance you've given to us as the church, that you would be magnified, glorified, and honored in Jesus' name. Please stand if you would. Our pastors are up here at the tables. Please start making a